Hi, I'm Darren Peppard. Welcome to the Leaning into Leadership podcast, the podcast dedicated to today's hardworking leader. Join me every Sunday for leadership insight, inspiration, and a little pep talk to keep you rolling down your road to awesome. Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome into episode 116 of the Leaning Into Leadership podcast, our first episode of 2024. So I know I'm not the first, but let me say, Happy New Year. I hope you're having a wonderful 2024. I hope you're off to a really good start on your goals or your resolutions, or maybe you're doing the one word, whatever it might be. I hope you're off to a great start. Maybe you're looking at trying to find ways to continue to sharpen the saw, continue to grow, continue to improve as a leader, and certainly dialing into shows like the Leaning Into Leadership podcast are a great way to go about doing that. And honestly, you've picked an excellent episode to jump in on. If this is your first episode, um, make sure you go back, check out the other 115 up to this point in time. Lots of really, really great stuff. Um, But today's episode, my guest on the show is Dr. Crystalyn Turney. If you don't know Dr. Turney, let me tell you this. She is a very highly experienced subject matter expert in school improvement initiatives, in leadership development, coaching and mentoring, and diversity, equity, and inclusion. She has dedicated over two decades to making education work and educators thrive. Dr. Turney has served as an English teacher, as a school improvement and literacy coach, assistant principal, principal, and district level administrator. So she certainly got the pedigree when she is out there helping schools to continue to grow and work on that continuous improvement. Dr. Turney and I had a fantastic conversation recently about school improvement, about leadership development, and all kinds of wonderful stuff. And you're going to catch that entire conversation, folks, right after this. Have you ever found yourself in professional development thinking, how is this supposed to help me be a better leader? Folks, PD for Leaders needs to focus on leadership. Introducing High Performance Leadership Teams, a two-day workshop from Road to Awesome. In this two-day workshop, we focus on getting the team very clear on their shared values, direction, and mission. Getting to know the house and understanding the strengths that each of us bring to the table and how we best leverage those. We focus on how we go about getting the work done. We focus on team dynamics. We focus on how it is that we continue to evolve together as a team. Hey, right now, it's a tough time to be a leader, and it's really difficult to grow together as a leadership team unless you're intentional. High Performance Leadership Teams is exactly that, an opportunity to be very intentional about your team. Hey, leaders, I want to work with your team. I want to help set you up for success. Send me an email at darrenmpeppard at roadtoawesome.net or shoot me a direct message on social media. Let's get your leadership team on the road to awesome with high-performance leadership teams. This podcast is a proud member of the Teach Better Podcast Network. Better today, better tomorrow, and the podcast to get you there. Explore more podcasts at www.teachbetterpodcastnetwork.com. Now let's get on to the episode. So often in education, we talk about how we can go about the process of school improvement. And there are all kinds of formulas and all kinds of beliefs and all kinds of different pathways that you can take when it comes to working on school improvement. But there is no magic bullet. There is no simple, if I just do this, the results that I'm looking for are going to happen. Folks, we have to be intentional. We have to define what success really looks like. And it takes some work. It really does. It takes getting everybody to buy in. And so today on the show, I have Dr. Crystal and Turney joining me. And we're going to talk about school improvement. We're going to probably talk a little bit about equity. We're going to talk a little bit about diversity. Um, and who knows where else this conversation might take us. But uh, Dr. Turney, thank you so much for joining me here on the show. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, absolutely. I'm looking forward to our conversation today. 
And uh, again, like you and I were talking just before we hit the record button, there is no magic formula to school improvement. Um, I'm a very strong believer that context matters and that everybody's school is different. Everybody's community is unique. And so when we talk about improvement, there is definitely um, some inward thinking, some inward reflection that needs to take place. And I know we're going to talk about that a little bit today. Uh, before we do that, just really quick for the folks that are tuning in that maybe um, have not started following you, tell them a little bit about you. Tell them a little bit about your journey and about uh, what it is that you do now. Absolutely. So I live in Cincinnati, Ohio, and I am a very proud Cincinnati Bengals fan. I worked in public education uh, for 20 years, started off as an English teacher, went on to uh, do some school improvement literacy work, assistant principal, middle school principal, high school principal, and then ended in district office. And in 2019, I decided to uh, start my own thing. I was already doing some consulting on the side and I saw some wonderful opportunities for me to really expand my reach uh, and my work uh, and to allow more time with my family and friends. And so I am married to Larry. Uh, together we have four children. Our oldest, Camille, she's in the Army. Uh, my son, Carson, he is in the workforce and also pursuing real estate. And then we have 12-year-old twins uh, who are in the sixth grade and who keep us very busy. And uh, we also have a three-year-old Pomeranian. So I wanted more time uh, for that. Um, and then again, to really expand my reach. So right now I work with schools and organizations in the areas of uh, DEI and B, um, also in school improvement as well as leadership. But I feel it all falls under that school improvement umbrella in which I look forward to talking more about today. Yeah, absolutely. So, so you mentioned, um, I'll chase this for just a second, and then we'll come back to the actual topic at hand. Okay. But you mentioned the Cincinnati Bengals. It's a good time to be a Bengals fan. Um, yeah. I am, uh, I'm not, not a Bengals fan, but I will tell you, because I am a Wyoming kid, um, a University of Wyoming grad, two times over, um, big fan of, and he's from my hometown, I actually know his dad, uh, Logan Wilson, your middle linebacker. Yes, so uh, yes, I, yes. I root for, I root for the Bengals for, for Logan. And um, definitely it, it's tough when the Bengals play the Bills because I'm also, you know, obviously yes. a fan of Josh Allen. So, and they were teammates <laughs> at, at the University of Wyoming. So, you know, yes. it's a win-win when those two guys are going against each other. But uh but yeah, Absolutely. so yeah, definitely, definitely talk about uh, some school improvement stuff. And, and uh, you mentioned the, the DEI work. I know that's, that's kind of where your consulting work kind of started. That's kind of where you yeah. began your journey. What, what was the call or what, what was like that, that thing tugging on you? I mean, I, I know what mine was when, when I stepped from, you know, 26 years in public ed into now the the leadership support work that I do what what was tugging on you what pulled you in that direction to start doing that work um, in 2019 Wow. So where do I really start? Um, so I grew up in, in Cincinnati, uh, North College Hill, and at the time it was a predominantly white district and so um, in, in exploring that I largely had uh, white teachers in my 13 years K through 12 in the district, I literally had uh, two staff members of color, two teachers actually um, of color. And so I wanted to be that teacher uh, for future students that I felt that I never had um, and that I wasn't able to connect with minus those two teachers. Fast forward, went to Bowling Green State University and in Ohio and really started to uh, explore this world of diversity and meeting other cultures and connecting with them even in my student teaching. And then once I started teaching, I started getting a lot of English language learners in my English class and many of them were newcomers and I taught high school English. So they were newcomers and um, having very limited English. And here I am attempting to teach them Shakespeare. So that led me on some exploration as it relates to how can I support those students? Not to mention, 
you know, keep it in mind, hey, I'm a, a black woman and I'm trying to help support other black students who might not see black teachers uh, as frequently. So all of those pieces really uh, continue to work together, um, even into school improvement work and working with a large urban in Ohio. It's the second largest urban in the state of Ohio, Cincinnati Public Schools. And then uh, going into my assistant principal role in which I worked in a suburban urban district. Um, we had, we were situated in suburban Cincinnati, but we had urban demographics. Starting my doctorate and actually doing some research on English language learners and how to be able to support them moving into my uh, assistant, well, from my assistant principal position to my middle school principal position, high school principal. So it really continued to go with me throughout. And so while I was in district office, um, our uh, district had been flagged uh, by the state for disproportionality as it related to uh, discipline of uh, boys, black boys specifically on an IEP. And so doing a lot of research and work around that to problem solve. How can we fix this problem and help close that gap of discipline, but also keeping in mind that it wasn't just the discipline gap we were trying to close, we were also trying to close the achievement gap, which really goes together. And in seeing that, seeing how we can maximize opportunities for uh, students of color or students from traditionally marginalized groups to have access to advanced placement courses, gifted courses, and college credit plus courses, as we knew that that was a way to be able to close that gap. So I gave you a very long answer, uh, but in short, just really going back um, in time from even when I was a student, and it was always a piece of that need for that DEI work there, that um, when I started my business, I'm like, listen, I've been chasing or connecting to uh, DEI since really I started school in, in kindergarten in the 80s. Um, so that was really that natural connection. Well, you know, they say we are uniquely positioned to help the person that we once were. So it, yeah. it makes a lot of sense that, that that's the work that ultimately has, has been your calling and that has really pulled pulled on you. I'm, I'm curious, just, just listening to you talk, um, and I don't want to like jump ahead of ourselves into, uh, into the school improvement work yet, but just listening to the way you speak around um, – discipline gaps, around achievement gaps, around um, just having more more diversity in our classrooms so that, that our kids, all of our kids can at some point in time have somebody in the classroom who looks like them. Um, Absolutely. It, to me, all of that wraps around and is such a huge part of school improvement. It isn't just simply let's focus on one particular thing. And I, I don't want to get ahead of myself. Um, I, I, I want to get to that conversation soon. But, but I want to have you maybe, maybe kind of take that a little bit and, and either push it back on me or, or run further with all the underpinnings that are mm -hmm. so important in our schools before we can even get to the true talk about school improvement, if that makes some sense. I'll let you just run with that. Absolutely. Absolutely. So thinking about when I wanted to become a teacher and even wanting to be that teacher that I felt that I really didn't have or was able to connect with, I got a lot of questions, especially from my Black peers. Why in the world are you going to be a teacher? We hate teachers, right? And so that was within that conversation itself to say, I know. And I'm trying to make a difference by being where in that place where I felt that greatest gap was. And not just for the students of color, the students who look like me, but other students. My first year of teaching, I was 22 years old and I was in a predominantly white uh, suburban high school. And even the white students were just enthusiastic about me 
and being in my class and being able to connect with me. They wanted to be there. And so, yes, I believe it was my natural energy and passion beyond how I look. But then there was that other piece that research has shown us how even students who are, are not uh, from traditionally marginalized groups or who are not black connect with black teachers. And maybe it's because they are, are rarely seen or maybe it's because that ability to have that, whatever that gap or missing piece of that sympathy to support that student where they are, especially because we have very well been in many of those situations ourselves. So, you know, if there's nothing else, there's always this push to um, encourage uh, black people, brown people um, to pursue um, we're of the world of education and being a teacher and not just a classified staff member, but a certified staff member so they can have a great impact and support. Um, and we are aware of the teacher shortage in general, but especially uh, when it comes to teachers of color. We will return to the Leaning into Leadership podcast in just a moment. But first, let me ask you a question. Have you ever said to yourself, man, I should write a book. Well, if you have, then let me ask you another question. What's holding you back? What keeps you from taking the step that moves you from, I have an idea about a book, to I am a published author? From experience, I would bet it's probably you're wondering who would even want to read a book that I wrote. Maybe you're questioning the idea. Is it unique enough? Is it valid enough? Is it good enough to be a book worthy of having published. Hey, as a best-selling author myself, I can tell you most writers have had the exact same feelings at some point in time during their writing journey. Here at Road to Awesome, we believe in cultivating leaders by elevating voices and promoting positivity. And a part of that work is publishing books for educators by educators. Go to roadtoawesome.net and hit the Contact Us button to set up a free, no obligation conversation about your book idea. Hey, educators, we've all had incredible experiences. We all have amazing stories, and every one of them deserves to be told. Go to roadtoawesome.net, hit the Contact Us button. Let's have that conversation about your book idea. And now, back to the Leaning into Leadership podcast. The book that you had uh, come out um, back in July, uh, July of 23. Um, really exciting. Congratulations on getting your thank book you. published. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, always, always an exciting time to get your book out. But the book is titled Five Months to School Improvement. And I know that, um, that you will hit the disclaimer very, very quickly with people that know this isn't a magic bullet and no, you don't um, right. solve or, or, you know, fix fix your needs improve your school in five months but i know we're going to talk about this from from a variety of different angles but let, let's just start with the title five months to school improvement tell me a little bit more absolutely so i i jokingly say that last november i was minding my own business which i rarely do and i got a call from someone who i had previously worked with and they said hey do you want to go to the cayman islands and of course i said yes and then i'm like wait a minute tell me more and so i found out that there were uh some schools that were identified that were um I identified by the Cayman government as uh, needing school improvement and they have been in that situation for a long time and they needed support. So they have partnered uh, with someone I had previously worked with. And so she reached out to me knowing that I had done um, school improvement work. So by January, I was off to uh, the Grand Cayman Islands. And of course, it was a beautiful place um, and exciting uh, culture and food and, and a new place for me. It was uh, winter time in Ohio. I left in the snow and I arrived in the Grand Cayman Islands and it was the beautiful sunshine and the crystal blue beaches. Uh, but beyond that, my assignment uh, was from January to June to work with a specific school to help turn around that school 
and to move them out of school improvement so that for their next inspection, they demonstrated that growth and that change. And so I flew back and forth uh, for those five months, five visits in total, and I uh, implemented various uh, plans, solutions, uh, provided professional development, uh, identified some areas of growth uh, in the short term as well as long term, and left them with a very strong strategic plan as well as demonstrating that we can do this and that there was 20% growth in both their ELA and math in those five months uh, based on their most recent uh, STAR assessment, which was in January, and then the next one was in June. So in that short period of time, we did a lot as it related to turnaround. So by my second trip, I was already seeing those uh, glimmers of hope. And I'm like, we can do this. So I started to uh, blog a little bit. I, I never published it, but I would kind of keep it and save it, uh, document uh, the things that I was doing, the results, some of the general conversations, and then really putting that together with all of my experiences in school improvement and saying I could package this up because I've replicated it so many times before. And now the twist is I've done it in five months. So that's the five months to school improvement. And just like you said, and I want to reiterate that disclaimer, this is not uh, the magic potion. You pour it in and five months later, ta-da. No, but it does give you a very strong framework for evaluation, implementation, as well as continuous improvement. I love that, and and what a, what a terrible place to have to go to do this work, right? You know, <laughs> right? Leave, leave the icy snow of Ohio and go hang out in Grand Cayman for five for five or six months. So, so it I'm curious. Um, yeah, I can, I can only imagine. Mm -hmm. um, definitely a tough assignment, but somebody had to do it. So, Crystal, and thank you for being the one to take that on. Um, I, I'm curious when you first came to the school. Um, as, as you're doing those initial observations and, and gathering information, what were some things that stood out to you that helped you start to put, um, put in motion the development of a, of a plan for them? Well, you know, I call myself the education problem solver. And I say that because throughout my career, I, I've seen problems and have had great confidence in being able to solve them. So whether that was going into a school as a principal where there was uh, you know, some culture and climate issues, I'm like, I can solve that problem. Whether it was going into a school and addressing disproportionality, I'm like, I can solve those problems. So walking in uh, to the school that I was assigned, one of the biggest things that I felt was lacking was that we can do this. We can solve this problem. I feel like maybe they have been in that place for so long that the morale around improving was absent. And so one of the very first things I did, hey, I'm here, we are going to do it. It might be tough, it might be uncomfortable at times, but I believe in you. I believe in our work together and I believe in my knowledge and expertise and how I've been able to successfully do it in other schools. And so as I started to peel back the layers of how can we bring about this change in a very short period of time, it did start with that morale piece and that culture and climate. But then we started to move into those gaps of systems and structures and policies to say, yeah, maybe we can approach our lesson planning in this way. Maybe we can approach how we um, discipline students in this way instead of being so punitive and removing them from school and instruction. Maybe we can provide them with instruction during that time that they are out and we can be restorative in our approaches. So just building on, again, my previous experiences and that passion around, I've done this so many times before in one way or another, and I can do it again, and let's do it again together. So you're a bit of a systems thinker, aren't you? I am. <laughs> <laughs> well, but I think, I think that's a huge piece, right? I mean, in, yeah. in the work I do, 
that's usually one of the bigger challenges that people have is a lack of systems, a lack of appropriate policies or procedures. And uh, in many cases, and I don't know what the story was with this particular school, but many schools that I have worked with or that I am working with that are kind of in like a targeted turnaround or, or something along those lines, mm -hmm. a lot of it simply comes from a lot of turnover. You know, maybe yes. they're on their fifth principle in seven years or something yeah. like that. And what and tends to happen is, it, absolutely it is. It absolutely yeah. is, yeah. you know, and, and that sense of hopelessness, like like you mentioned yeah. to, to kind of start that, um, those things, those things don't happen by accident. They happen when those systems erode and, and mm -hmm. teachers are left to kind of fend for themselves. Um, and then, so that's where you get all the inconsistencies and, and that type of thing. So I'm, I'm curious, what did you, what did you see? What did you feel from, from working with that staff when it became, let's start putting these pieces in place. Was there, was there a lot of, yes, I, I'm on board with this or did you, was there some resistance? Was there some pushback with, without getting too detailed? I'm just, I'm yeah. curious because I know, I know um, the bulk of, of the listening audience are in kind of that situation. And I'm yes. sure they're thinking, yeah, but you don't know the group I have. Right. Right. And I don't know the group that they have, but I feel like I've worked with every single type of group in every scenario. So I've worked with groups where they're like, yes, we are all in. We are ready to change. Whatever you say, Dr. Turney, that's what we are going to do. And then I've worked with groups where it's like, no, we're, it's hopeless, not going to change. You'll stick around for five months or, you know, in this case, five months or when I was a principal, oh, you'll stick around for a year or so and then you'll find something better and then we'll just kind of live in our puddle of sadness uh, forever. Yeah. Uh, but for this particular experience, it was a roller coaster. When we first entered, it was, yes, we got this, we can do it. And then when we started to put in the work and the time, then here comes that uncomfortable feeling of now I have to change, not only the way I've done things, but the way I think about things how I talk to my students, my colleagues, how I present myself, that change made people very uncomfortable. And so in that, you know, it's kind of like if, if they're feeling uncomfortable, now they're going to make you feel uncomfortable. But I feel like, you know, I'm a brick wall, been there, done that. You're, there's nothing you can say or do to me that's going to make me, you know, run, basically. Um, been there, done that, right? So in this experience, it was definitely a roller coaster experience of highs and lows. And we started very high. Yes, we got it. Then we went to like the lowest of lows to the point of resistance, you know, to the point of we're not going to do it. Her time is going to expire pretty quickly here. Uh, she's going to leave and then we'll go back to our happy ways of doing it as we once did it. Right. Um, yeah. But then that push for me, because this isn't new to me. I, I know what resistance is. I know what it looks like. And I know my walk around uh, to push, to motivate, uh, and to really complete the job that we started. And so ending on that high note, when all of those lows and we get back those scores, and then there I kind of sit back and say, see, I told you, <laughs> you know, we did it, told you, if you just listen, you know, and then there was a, another piece of me that's like, wow, we did this um, and, and had 20% growth in five months. If you would have listened at the beginning, we could have had 40% or whatever. But again, it was that idea uh, for me to be able to share and replicate that because I, I have seen um, almost every, uh, angle of this. Yeah. So, so what advice would you have for the school leader who maybe they're new in their role or maybe, maybe they've been in their role for a little while and things have just stayed kind of stagnant or maybe even things have kind of, you know, regressed a little bit as far as what their achievement looks like. Um, maybe they have that, that staff that can be a little bit resistant. I mean, Let's be honest, we all always had, you know, a small percentage, you know, I had five as a high school principal, I had five that were 
Wow. It didn't matter what it was they were going to push back against. Um, so I'm not talking about like just the everybody's got them. The staff right. that's even a little bit more resistant. What might be some advice for for school leaders who they they want to make the change? They they they've got a pretty good clear plan in their head. Uh, here's where we need to go, but they're running into into that brick wall. Well, so first of all, you got to get that plan out of your head uh, and onto paper and with stakeholders who are going to have that level of buy-in, who are going to be uh, the eyes and ears with this message um, and the voice with the message outside of the principal's office, outside of the superintendent's office, right? So starting, um, I would say, small in the sense of let's revisit our vision and our mission and do we have a strategic plan? And if so, do we need to realign them uh, to start this movement and know that it's not going to happen overnight. It is not a five months to success. However, with um, a, a great push and effort and focus on that mission, vision and plan that within five months, it is very possible that you are seeing that growth and movement enough that now you are gaining that additional support and buy-in to continue to help it grow. And that they can see, oh wow, with just a little bit um, of, of effort, we got this. Now what can we do if we put in more effort or if we continue down this same path? Uh, for a new leader uh, in this situation or one that has been in a struggling situation for an extended period of time, Again, it is what are these uh, nuggets of hope, our lowest hanging fruit, are ways that we can grab onto things that are going to have the greatest impact in the shortest period of time. And one of those, again, getting that buy-in, even if you talked about your five who were against, there's at least five who are for. Grabbing those five and saying, let's go and then making that five into 10 and to more. Absolutely, it's about building momentum, yeah. And, yes. um, and, and something you're talking about there too without actually you know, calling out the words of it is just really defining it too. Like those, those milestones of progress, what does it look like and, and how can we be real clear about that? I love that so, so very much. So uh, let's do this. We've reached that point in the, in the show where I ask you the same question I ask everybody else who's, who's here on the show. It's the Leaning Into Leadership podcast. So Dr. Turney, how are you leaning into leadership right now? Well, for me, it's being that lifelong learner. How can I continue to improve myself, improve my craft, and support others? So one of the services that I provide under that school improvement is that leadership coaching and mentoring. But I feel like I can't lead others to be good leaders if, number one, I wasn't a good leader to begin with, and number two, I'm not continuing to improve my leadership skills and enhancing my craft as a leader. So I love reading. Um, I uh, subscribe to ASDD, and coincidentally, this month, um, the uh, magazine topic what new leaders lead need, excuse me. And as I was reading this uh, through a very a couple of these articles, I started thinking about, yes, new leaders need this, but old leaders need it too. And sometimes as leaders, we have to undergo that shift. Um, and we have to revisit ourselves as new leaders and even reinvent ourselves. So just constantly, reading, exploring, connecting, knowing that um, I don't know everything, I don't know have all the answers, but I wanna be able to provide that support. And that's how I lean into leadership. I need to be a good leader myself to help others be great leaders and uh, to continue to grow myself so that I can continue to help others grow. Love it so much. So how would somebody get in touch with you? How do they connect with you? How do they find you on social media? Because I'm sure people are going to want to learn a little bit more about Crystal Interney. 
Absolutely. So the easiest way is to Google Dr. Crystalline Turney. And I feel like I have a market on uh, every platform that if you Google Dr. Crystalline Turney, I will pop up for pages, great things and ways to uh, connect with me. But more specifically, uh, my uh, email address is info at drcrystallineturney.com. And then also my web address is www.drcrystalline.com. And then uh, my Facebook, Dr. Crystalline, Instagram, Dr. Crystalline, LinkedIn, Dr. Crystalline Turney, uh, Twitter, Dr. Crystalline Turney. I'm even on TikTok. Um, not such a great TikToker just yet, but I'm even there under Dr. Crystalline as well. Outstanding. Thanks so much, folks. We'll put all that stuff down in the show notes so you can go and catch up with Dr. Crystal and Turney. Thank you so much, Crystal Lynn, for joining me here on the Leaning Into Leadership podcast. It's been a pleasure. Yes, thank you. All right. Once again, thanks so much, Dr. Crystal and Turney, for joining me here on the Leaning Into Leadership podcast. Fantastic episode. Just so much fun. And now it's time for a pep talk. Folks, this week on the pep talk, I'm talking about New Year's resolutions. You know, it's one thing to identify a resolution, but achieving it is a completely different effort, right? Building new habits to support your resolutions is going to be crucial for long-term success. So whether you're trying to lose weight, exercise more, or even quit a bad habit, developing new, new habits is going to be the key. First, make sure you start small. Break down your resolution into smaller, actionable steps. For example, if your resolution is to be in more classrooms, start by committing to just one or two every day. As you build consistency, then gradually increase the number and the frequency of your walkthroughs. Second, hold yourself accountable. Find a method that works for you, whether that's tracking with some kind of progress journal, use a habit tracking app, or even partnering with a fellow principal. Regularly reviewing your progress will help you stay on track and it'll motivate you towards your goals. Lastly, be patient and be kind to yourself. Building new habits takes time. It takes effort. Remember to celebrate the small victories along the way and give yourself some grace when setbacks occur. Stay determined and you're going to find the positive impact of these new habits on your resolutions. Have a road to awesome week. Thank you so much for joining me here on the Leaning Into Leadership podcast. Until next time, I'm Dr. Darren Peppard. Thank you for listening to the Leaning Into Leadership podcast brought to you by Road to Awesome. Don't forget, click subscribe, give a review, and share this with somebody who might also enjoy leaning into leadership.